We've noted that Paul was in a hurry to make his way to Jerusalem. There would be a feast there at Pentecost, and he wanted to be with the people of God there in that great city. And so there was an intention on his part to get there as quickly as possible. He knew that if he set foot in Ephesus, there would be all kinds of pastoral demands on him. People coming to him, asking him for his counsel and advice. Uh, people who would be eager to see him. And no doubt, many folks that he himself would like to see as well. And rather than getting bogged down in the city of Ephesus and seeing all the believers in the church there, instead skirted past the city to Miletus, a port city nearby. I think it's about 30 miles distance away from Ephesus. And there, from there, he summoned the elders of the church in Ephesus. Clearly, the church has uh, become quite a large gathering of God's people. And there were a number of men whom God had committed to the calling of being overseers within Christ's church there in Ephesus. And Paul calls on them to come and meet with them so that he might deliver to them a very important message. Paul had great concern for the church of Ephesus. He had seen the, the, the great temple to Artemis and all the uh, uh, interest in magic that uh, went throughout that great city. So he understood the various temptations that would be uh, facing this congregation. He understood as well from his travels abroad how people would follow after him, uh, whom we know in his epistles as uh, what are described as Judaizers, or men who would come from Jerusalem or elsewhere pretending to be disciples of Jesus Christ, but urging the people to observe the laws of Moses and so forth. And so Moses wanted to warn the elders to watch out, to be concerned for the flock entrusted to their care. So he summons them to meet with him there at Miletus, there at the port. And before he takes leave of them, he uses this one very solemn moment, a last word and testimony, if you will, of the Apostle Paul to the church. He uses this one moment to impress upon them the importance of watching out for the flock and trust to their care. This would be so important that Paul would call them to make this journey out to see him. All these men come to him rather than him just meeting with them there in Ephesus come away from the church, separated from all the distractions and so forth and, and, and entanglements in Ephesus, come here and focus on this one thing that I have to tell you. Listen, Paul says, you're called to be overseers of the flock. You've got to pay attention to yourselves and to your flock. Christ is committed to your care. It's a message that is important for us to hear. Not only those of us who do serve in office as elders and pastor, but also it applies to everyone here and to all who will hear this message. We who have various responsibilities and callings in life, responsibilities as parents, caring for children or grandchildren, bearing witness to family members alike, we too need to be careful in instructing our families in the whole counsel of God urging them and beseeching them to listen to what God has to say to them. And so each of us has a certain sphere of influence, a certain measure of responsibility to which God calls us to be careful for. And whether you're an officer in the church or one who teaches in the church or uh, simply a parent or uh, an individual with responsibilities towards others, Christ speaks to you here by his word. To pay attention to yourself and to those who are trusted to your care. I want to take a look at what Paul has to say to the uh, Ephesians uh, just briefly. Uh, hopefully it will be brief. I tend to talk a little bit. But uh, we'll talk first about, about this great counsel of God that is given to the church. And what all that means. Paul makes the point to these uh, elders that I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. He didn't withhold anything in all of God's revelation, but spoke powerfully and clearly about it all. And so we'll talk about this counsel that God has given to his church that's entrusted to our care. And then second, we'll take a look at the way in which Paul faithfully administered that counsel to his congregation. 
and how he uses his own example as something of a, a white hot iron to impress it upon the hearts and minds of those who are there to listen to him, elders in particular. That just as you've seen me conduct myself within the church, so you also must conduct yourself in the same manner, with the same integrity, with the same passion and desire for the people of God. And so we'll talk about the manner or the way in which he proclaimed this great counsel given to us by God. So first, this counsel that God, that, that Paul proclaimed. There's, I want to look at it from two perspectives. First, there's a certain uh, center to the whole counsel of God that is of fundamental importance that we need to grasp that almost in every sermon there ought to be something of this given to us. And that is, as Paul describes it, uh, he preached repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we come to the very center of God's counsel. What it is that God calls upon us to do. There needs to be repentance from our sins and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I like what Spurgeon had to say in, in one illustration that he makes use of here when he describes repentance as faith as the hinge and the door that swings on the hinge. The two are together and never apart. You can never have just repentance without faith or faith without true repentance. Uh, they go side by side. And so repentance towards God is an expression of true faith. And true faith, which believes the word of God, moves the individual to repentance. Now let's talk, talk about both of them. Repentance towards God. This repentance has the basic idea of a change of mind about ourselves, about our conduct, our behavior before God. It says that I have sinned and done that which is uh, wrong in God's sight. I have violated God's law in a wide variety of ways. Repentance acknowledges my sin. Acknowledges that it is evil and that I, I am justly to be punished for that sin. And then repentance turns to God and pleads to Him for the forgiveness of that sin. For the washing away of that sin. You'll note Paul emphasizes the fact that repentance is towards God. There are many varieties of repentance that are not true. And we should take a moment to examine ourselves and to see whether we have true repentance. Because true repentance focuses on God and the offense we have uh, made against God by our sins. But many have a repentance that uh, is uh, upset because of the consequences of our sin. My drunkenness has caused me to have a, a, a bad liver. My uh, uh, sexual immorality has brought upon myself a variety of sexually transmitted diseases. And so there are consequences that I don't like. My gambling addiction has brought about uh, an, uh, an impoverishment to me and my family. Uh, all kinds of consequences to our sin and sometimes we get upset with the, the nature of our sin because of all the consequences that have come to us because of it. And so therefore we want to reform our lives and get rid of all these things because of all the evil that's come about. Well, that may be well enough in and of itself, but it's not true repentance. True repentance is that which says that I have sinned against God. And so my immorality, my, my thievery, my wastefulness, my rebellion, all these things have been sins ultimately against God himself. And I must come to God and plead for his forgiveness for these sins. And for a new heart, a new attitude, a new power to live a more godly and righteous life. So just because you've had bad experiences in life and you're upset about that doesn't mean that you've experienced true repentance. You might experience a sense of shame and guilt over the sins that you've committed. And shame over the fact that others have now seen your, your sin. And now because of that, you've got to change or make some uh, restitution for your actions. Some folks, they get found or discovered in sin and suddenly they put on a sad face. But as soon as the discovery goes away, they're back into their sin again and back doing what they wanted. There's never a true repentance. 
a true change of heart. The message of the gospel must include a call to repentance, a recognition of what sin is as defined by God's law, and a call to abandon that sin and to live a more Christ-like life. And if you hear preaching that never talks about repentance, that only talks about God's love and all the good things that can come to you if you uh, commit your ways to Him, you're not having a ministry that's preaching the whole counsel of God. We need to be confronted with our sins and we need to be called to repentance for them. And simply focusing on the, the positive things, the sweet things, the nice things about the gospel, the love of God, the hope of eternal life, all these things, as wonderful as they are, they need to be balanced and informed by the more darker counsels of God's word as well. So repentance for sin, which is repentance towards God. And secondly, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There must be a, an understanding of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished by his death on the cross. There must be a commitment to him that he himself paid the full penalty for my sins. Not just that he uh, died as a revolutionary or as a great teacher who uh, was the object of jealousy and envy on the part of those who were around him and they needed to get, a, get rid of him and so he died because of that. He was a sacrifice to a noble idea. No, he was the, the sacrifice for our sins, bearing the full penalty for our sins that was due to us by our violations of law. God punished Christ for us. And faith in Christ looks to him and says that his death is for me and on my behalf. And so the message of the gospel will be a message about faith in Jesus and trusting in him, committing yourself to him and to his care. Paul uses some uh, amazing language here when he talks about in his instructions to the elders. He says to pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock. Uh, which God has appointed you as overseers. Uh, and he describes this church of God as those for whom God uh, shed his blood. Now that's a real unusual language in the scriptures. And sometimes there, there are translations which, has, which have changed it to, from God to Lord to kind of emphasize that this Christ that has died and shed his blood, and that's true. But more than likely, the text originally says that God shed his blood for us. Emphasizing the great value of the death of Christ. This precious blood. Which is the blood of the very human Jesus. But also the God-man Jesus. Whose blood now has infinite value. That blood was shed for us. And so Paul urges the church, elders and pastors, to preach repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is the, at the center and heart of our message, but more broadly, there's this whole counsel of God, or what he also describes as proclaiming the kingdom, or later on as the gospel of the grace of God. Here in summary is the whole proclamation of God's word and how it applies to every area of life. God's Word teaches us ethically how we should live before God in every circumstance of life. God's Word teaches us how we should believe. And the various truths of God's Word are given to us. And we should entrust ourselves to them. In recent generations, there's been a great skepticism that has swept across uh, Europe and North America and much of the world where there's been skepticism focused on the creation account and whether God created Adam and Eve uh, out of the dust of the earth and, and an alternative explanation has come forward as man evolving from the, 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 the ground, from the slime, from amoeba or what have you uh, through uh, a variety of evolutionary forms until he finally comes to his own place. And science says we can explain man apart from God, we don't really need God anymore. Then there's been skepticism with regard to the integrity of Scripture, the inspiration of the text, questioning whether God's Word is 
true and consistent in all that it has to say. And this skepticism has had a, a vast impact upon the broader nature of the church, such that in many mainline Protestant pulpits, you really have pastors preaching there who don't believe in the integrity of Scripture. You don't believe in the authority of Scripture as being God's inerrant word. And so the testimony of Scripture about the creation, the fall of man, and the sin, the judgment, and so forth, is dismissed, reinterpreted, and understood differently. Elders and pastors in particular need to guard the flock of God from this kind of preaching, this kind of skepticism that has risen up within the church and warn against these wolves who seek to destroy and lead people astray. Uh, I was reading a sermon by Spurgeon again in which he talked about having not changed his views in, in the preaching of the gospel for, for some 30 years at, at that point in time in which he was preaching. He started preaching when he was about 18 years of age. He became a very popular preacher at about that age in London. And uh, Crowds upon thousands upon thousands would come and hear him year after year after year. And he said, 33 years later, the same gospel that I preached then, I preach today, and I have not changed, and I have no interest in changing. He says, with regard to the modern movements that are already at work in his day, in the late 1800s, that this modern thought is not the kind of thought that inspires people to lay down their lives for Jesus Christ. Why would you lay down your life? For a gospel that just simply says, well, you should live a good life. We don't know if there is an afterlife, if there is an eternal life. We don't have an atonement for our sins. We just try to improve ourselves and make our way a little bit better. Hopefully things will be all right. That's not something to lay down your life for, and that's certainly not reflective of the church over the centuries where thousands upon thousands, perhaps millions of Christians have given up their lives for the sake of the truths of the gospel. And Paul here shows the way he himself conducted himself in the proclamation of this great counsel of God, in the way that he went publicly and from house to house, preaching the word of God, explaining it to each one individually, at times even with tears, persuading them to believe in the Lord Jesus and to walk with him. Paul faced many dangers, he faced many attacks against him, he had to flee a variety of attempts on his life, and yet he persisted in this great message. He understood that in the future there were laid up for him imprisonment and chains, and yet he still continued in that great gospel. What is it that produces such a man? It's a message of a Savior who died to atone for all of our sins and gave us a perfect righteousness. It's the message of one who has risen from the dead and has given us everlasting life. That's what makes us bold in the face of death, ready to lay down our lives. Just the other day on Facebook, I, one of my friends uh, posted pictures of, I think it was about 16 or 18 Egyptian Christians who would have their heads taken off by ISIS. Why is it that they persist in holding to the faith in the Lord Jesus and will not recant, will not bow down to Allah? It's because this gospel is a gospel of salvation that leads us to eternal life. And there's no other help anywhere else. No other hope. They know that. And they committed themselves to that. Paul said he was ready to die. And each of us must have that same attitude. We never know when we, we might face the same sort of thing. And the only way you can face that is by knowing the gospel of grace. Understanding it and its center in the work of repentance and faith and the full extent of its application to all of life. Rest in that gospel. Follow after it and trust in Lord Jesus. And in your care for loved ones, speak that word fully and faithfully. That's right. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning on this winter's day. Thank you for those who have come together 
and, and have heard your word. We pray that you would impress that word on our hearts, that we would compare ourselves with the Apostle Paul and know that he himself would only say that we are to imitate him as he imitated Christ. Grant us grace, O Lord, to follow after you. Forgive us for our sins. We ask for your blessings in Jesus' name.